So critical care, I felt like, was a good little topic to round out our emergency medicine stuff and thinking about what happens to patients once they leave an emergency department or transfer. Oh, I don't know what's going on in my computer here. There we go. Anyway, so let's talk about some critical care stuff. We'll go through this pretty quick. A lot of this we've talked about in various capacities already, but just to review some of the topics quickly. So critically ill, I usually think of um, severe organ system failure or dysfunction um, and acute changes, so affecting the, the status of the patient. So usually these patients are really complicated medically. They're often on one-to-one -one nursing ratios. So um, this isn't uncommon to see in an ICU room, just like all these things hanging. If you don't know what they are, they're, well, this is a dialysis machine. But these are like IV pumps. So you might see, well, it looks like kind of a Christmas tree of IV pumps because a person has so many drips running or different medications infusing at once. Um, usually there's a lot of comorbid disease states going on in a critically ill patient. Not only do you have to manage the critical concern, but also not neglect other things that might be happening. So if they have a psych history or, um, you know, if they have diabetes, you have to make sure those are getting managed as well. Um, fluid and electrolyte changes are tricky. Most of these patients are going to have um, various volume issues, and a lot of times they're going to have electrolyte abnormalities. So potassium and magnesium monitoring especially is really important. And a lot of times they're not taking anything orally or tolerating orals for various reasons, but if they are, the GI tract might not be moving quite as well as it would be. So that's not necessarily a reliable way to get medications into your patient. Um, other complications with, uh, if the patient is ventilated, uh, you have decreased venous return, decreased cardiac output, decreased hepatic renal blood flow, and if you have a therapeutically cooled patient, you have decreased metabolism overall, so your drugs might stick around a little longer. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about MAP today. MAP, if you're curious what it means, it's mean arterial pressure. That's the uh, equation for it. Normal is 70 to 100. Um, global perfusion, usually 60 to 65 is considered adequate. So usually if they say titrate to a MAP of 60 or something, that's pretty common for a presser starting dose. Um, it correlates, correlates directly with volume status. So your cardiac output and stroke volume preload and total volume status are all related that way. Um, central venous pressure is a reflective of preload. Uh, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is cardiac function related to blood volume and less ventricular volume. And cardiac index is cardiac output over body surface area. So when we talk about some of this stuff with respect to pressors, I don't really care if you know a lot of this from my class, uh, but we'll talk about this with respect to pressors and what they do. So just so we're all on the same page here with the acronyms and such. All right, so shock. Um, you've got three types of shock, cardiogenic, septic, and hypovolemic. We've talked about these in various capacities throughout the course, but just to review, cardiogenic, your um, cardiac index goes down, so your wedge pressure is up and your vascular resistance is up. Septic, your cardiac index goes up, your wedge pressure goes down, and vascular resistance goes up. And hypovolemic wedge pressure goes down, vascular resistance goes Oh, sorry, septic, they both go down, excuse me. And uh, hypovolemic, it's, it's compensatory. Um, ongoing management is co quite complicated depending, and you might not necessarily know what's causing the shock initially because they can present somewhat similarly. And um, our goal with all types of shock is basically the same thing. We want to prevent uh, end organ damage and hypoperfusion, and so just how we get there is different depending on whether we're treating sepsis or like acute heart failure exacerbation. All right, so let's talk about the first step with it, with some types of shock. So basically, unless it's cardiogenic, and even in some cardiogenic shocks, you might give volume depending on what the patient's status looks like. Um, in a lot of heart failure exacerbations, it's probably not going to be applicable, but in some cases, you might. Uh, so if you're volume down um, or if you're volume normal, you're going to try and use volume first to see if you can uh, increase blood pressure and stabilize the, the blood pressure hemodynamic situation that way. So crystalloid structure, so basic fluids are fine. Uh, most times people are going to bolus with normal saline. We don't really give D5 boluses, or sometimes they use lactated ringers, and I think they're, they were thinking that there was some evidence that says lactated ringers in like septic patients was better than just standard normal saline, but I don't think that panned out. Um, anyway, we don't really use it. The only place I see lactated ringers used a lot is in mother baby, in our, sorry, our OB section, that's what we call it at Abbott. And um, normal saline is going to be used for the vast majority of patients. We don't give D5 infusions continuously just because that's a lot of sugar to put into somebody and you don't really need it. Uh, the, as far as normal saline goes, if you push a little bit too much sodium into the person, which would be hard with NS, but you could theoretically get there, um, you might end up just peeing out more sodium. So as long as the kidneys are working to a certain degree or you're dialyzing or something, you, you don't really have to worry about any complications with normal saline. 
um, colloids. So this would be if somebody's having some uh, third spacing going on, if they're malnourished and their vascular proteins are low. So if they don't have a good albumin level, they're, you can pump a lot of fluid into them and it can just leak out. Um, if you up their albumin, uh, then you can hold on to some of that fluid better. So um, albumin is one of the first things to give uh, somebody if they aren't really responding well to fluids. Also, if somebody loses a lot of blood and you don't have blood at hand, you can give albumin too because it's kind of like, think of blood products almost as colloidal as well because there's a lot more to them right than just fluid. So uh, albumin is kind of a replacement. So if you work in procedural areas or anything like that, that might be something you'll see done is like if somebody starts bleeding out in the OR, they might shove a bunch of albumin into the person quickly while they're figuring out when they can get blood, especially if the patient um, isn't typed and screened or anything like that. Um, collides are more expensive, as you might imagine. Um, salt water, sugar water, quite cheap in comparison, speaking to what these are. These are usually, um, have a starch and dextrin, don't worry about that, it's rarely ever used anymore. Uh, but albumin is like human protein that they isolate and, and put into, uh, from, from blood products and blood supply. So it's not cheap, it's not terribly expensive, but anyway, the process is a lot more complicated than just a simple fluid uh, resuscitation. All right, so fluid, fluid boluses as soon as possible, monitor, continue to provide support within six hours um, with uh, associated with survival improvement if you give fluid boluses within six hours of shock uh, identification. Treatment goals, again, map above 65, um, some of this other stuff, May or may not be important to measure. In the meantime, you're going to go off map for most things. Um, titrate fluid to achieve goals. Uh, if you can't get it there with fluids, which is common, especially in a, like a severe septic picture, you're going to be adding a presser on board. So pressors, as a reminder, they increase blood pressure and or cardiac output, and so they increase tissue perfusion that way. Um, basically, this is provider um, choice, what they want to give, but there are some specific tools we can use to guide our treatment. Uh, and that's basically understanding the receptors that the different drugs hit. So um, beta-1 receptors increase myocardial contractility. Chrono, chrono, uh, they increase heart rate, I should just say, via this uh, sinoatrial node. Beta-2 hel helps with um, coronary arterial vasodilation and bronchodilation. And alpha um, activity helps with peripheral vasoconstriction. So these are all going to be agonists at these different receptors, and that's the cause they're going to happen. So some drugs will do a lot of this stuff. Some are more selective for others. So again, we talked about this last fall, but just to review, <clears throat> since pressors are a big component of critical care medicine, usually if you're in an ICU, depends on what you're there for, but a lot of times your blood pressure is not all that great. So it's not uncommon to have a lot of ICU patients on some sort of a presser drip. So um, phenylephrine is a pure alpha agent, basically. It does have some beta activity, theoretically, if you gave a ton of it, but we basically think of it as a peripheral vasoconstrictor. You give it as a drip, and it doesn't really have any effects on the heart. It's a nice choice as an adjunct for a lot of things, but most people don't use it by itself. Um, where they do like to use phenylephrine a ton is for people who have um, procedural sedation-related um, hypotension. That's not really related to this directly, but if you're hypotensive after, you know, maybe got a little bit too much narcotic or they gave you too much ketamine or whatever while you were sedated in the OR, um, a lot of times they'll give you little bumps of phenylephrine or maybe even start a phenylephrine drip to keep your blood pressure up. They don't really want to do anything to the heart because you don't have any heart issues, you aren't in cardiogenic shock, the beta receptors are irrelevant in that situation, but if they can clench down on your peripheral vasculature a little bit, it helps with the support, and then they can titrate their anesthesia a little bit better. So CRNAs or um, anesthesiologists do this a lot where they kind of walk this fine line with phenylephrine where they give phenylephrine kind of this continuous little drip rate and they can titrate their anesthesia on top of it. Now, is that the correct way to do it? I don't know. Different providers say different things. I have some anesthesiologists I work with who hate that people do that. They think phenylephrine should be kind of a last ditch thing that you only give it. You should be able to do your anesthesia well enough that you don't need it. But anyway, if you work procedurally, don't be surprised if your patients get, or if you work a you know, post-op or anything like that with uh, with a surgery group, um, don't be surprised if you see phenylephrine being used. It's really common in procedural areas. As far as a presser goes, it's really not a first line option for like an ICU patient. It would be a second line or an adjunct option. So norepinephrine is often the first line. <clears throat> and norepinephrine, funny enough, is really kind of like phenylephrine. It does, it's not all that different, especially at low dose. Pretty much just an alpha um, agonist. It does have some beta activity too, so you might get some increased heart rate. And especially the higher the drip rate you go, or the yeah, the higher the larger amount of 
uh, norepinephrine you pump into the body, the more beta activity you're going to get. Mostly beta 1. You do have to get it pretty high to get some beta 2 activity there. Epinephrine is not usually used routine, so unlike these two, which are quite commonly used routinely, uh, epinephrine is more or less like we talked about with emergency medicine. So it's an ACLS med. It's something we give in acute situations. We don't really sustain drips of, on, of epinephrine on people. Sometimes we start a drip on, of epinephrine, but the idea is to convert them off to something else. So um, usually if somebody comes in in the field, sometimes EMS will start an epi drip on somebody to sustain pressure because they're responding to it. And we almost always get rid of it right away just because outcomes with long-term epi use are really poor. Uh, whereas some of these other ones you can actually sustain without having too much problem. The problem with epi is it has so much cardiac activity. And when you really stimulate the heart aggressively for a long period of time, it's just your body can't sustain that type of stress on the system in addition to all the other things that are going on. So I think of that kind of like the, the ultimate. If you really need it, it's there, but it's only for those really critical situations. Uh, dobutamine is, I think, sort of a functional, well, as far as if you're going to compare opposites, it's sort of the opposite of phenylephrine on the receptor side. So you've got beta 1, beta 2 activity, and then very high doses might get alpha activity, but we really don't worry about alpha. We think of dobutamine as a pure beta agonist. Um, dopamine is going to work on the dopamine receptors, which are found in similar, they work similar to some of these other ones. It's going to cause some peripheral vasoconstriction. Um, you also get some increased blood flow to the kidneys. And uh, it does have some beta activity too once it's at a little bit of a higher rate. So it is an inotrope uh, from that perspective. Um, some people think dopamine is good for if you have a patient who is maybe in renal failure or looking at uh, acute kidney injury due to being um, in a shock state, they might consider dopamine over something else. But I don't know if the evidence is really all that great to support it. But it's certainly an option, and it's, it's somewhat commonly used. Uh, vasopressin is another one that's a really common routine choice for ICU use, and it's, again, an adjunct. So what I see done most often is people are using norepinephrine, and then they're adding vaso or adding phenylephrine to that to add a little bit extra. Um, vasopressin is just going to be a peripheral vasoconstrictor. It's not going to have any effects on the heart. Um, it works on a different mechanism through the vasopressin receptor system, which is slightly different than our um, sympathomimetic system. It does basically the same thing in a roundabout way, but it's a different drug, and so you get some more synergy from it. So that's why I think it's a popular add-on choice. So if it were me, um, norepinephrine would be kind of the first choice I'd pick for my presser. And then I'd go with vasopressin as my add-on. But you can pick a number of things. The, the, the ones to really remember as standouts are that, you know, epinephrine itself is not a routine thing that we do in drips unless we really need it. Um, dobutamine would only be really for cardiogenic shock. It's only going to hit. It's not going to give you any peripheral support. So if your vascular resistance is down, it's not going to help with, like, a septic shock picture. That wouldn't make any sense. Um, dopamine is kind of a jack-of-all trades. It has a little bit of everything, and it could be used in pretty much any situation. But it does at least in my experience, get less use than the other ones that we have. So, And then millerinone. Uh, millerinone we talked about briefly a couple times already this summer. Uh, that's a positive inotrope that has a different mechanism. So again, if you had cardiogenic shock and you need more inotropic activity, that would be a choice, but not a routine option. So this just goes along with what I pretty much just said, talking about the initial drugs of choice. Uh, norepinephrine, again, drug of choice. Dopamine I kind of put up there as well because it, it is a, that jack of all trades. And I think I said this before, but it's probably worth saying again, dopamine does come as a pre-made bag from a manufacturer. And I know that sounds stupid and you guys probably don't care about that. But the nice thing is you can get access to that a lot easier. And that can be on an ambulance. It could be in an area where you don't have access to refrigeration. Um, it's just going to be more com more faster to get in some situations than making a drip of norepinephrine, which is, doesn't have a lot of stability at room temperature once it's compounded, unfortunately. So anyway, you can use them all together, even if you're like, well, some of those receptors seem like they do kind of the same thing. Why would you do vas like phenylephrine and norepinephrine? You wouldn't think it would do much, but I think it, it does target it a little bit to the point where you're, you're, if you give two drugs, maybe you block more receptors that way. It does seem to work, believe it or not, even though functionally it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, oh, uh, giving these through a central line, if you're working 
uh, emergency medicine or critical care and your patient has peripheral access, you can give press pressors peripherally, but because they cause so much vasoconstriction, um, they're going to be really hard on the vasculature and you can't really sustain that. So a question I get from my providers a lot is, how long can I do that? Well, as, as little time as possible. So get the central line in as soon as you can in those types of situations. That's what, that's what you'd want to do. If you need to keep it going for a few hours, you can. It's just you might lose that line. That's, just, that's the thing. You, it could stay patent and you might be fine with it, uh, but the, the risk goes up the longer it goes. So there's no real restrictions on that, but um, you should have these through central line if you can because it's just too hard for the peripheral veins. Uh, dosing is a little tricky here and there. Most institutions have a standard. There are standard doses for it, but they're usually something weight-based, but they sometimes convert. So like the dosing might be in mic per kilo per minute, but then what you see on it on the chart, like when a nurse goes to document on it, it might come up as mils per minute. It might calculate out. So just know that those, to, to know what units you're talking about when you're, when you're dosing these or recommending doses. Um, high doses provide more alpha activity, so uh, well actually, sorry, that's not entirely correct. That's just for dopamine. Um, like if we go back to this, like norepinephrine, higher doses will provide more beta activity, so sorry, that's a little misleading. Uh, but let's talk about dopamine as an example. So dopamine, actually, the higher doses push into beta activity, or sorry, alpha activity, excuse me. So um, Two to four micrograms renal, you're going to increase mesenteric blood flow. You're not going to do a whole lot more than that. Might get some peripheral uh, vasoconstriction, maybe a little bit of beta activity, but probably not enough to be noticeable. Um, once you get a little higher than that, you're going to have your inotropic activity. And then if you push it up further than that, you're going to get a significant amount of vasoconstriction. However, know that the dopamine receptors themselves do provide vasoconstriction. So you do get some pressor support even at lower doses. It's just if you really want it as an alpha, agent, you got to push the dose a little bit higher. So again, it's just kind of a weird example as to how those doses work and why you might use one over the other and what the rates matter. So like if somebody is, uh, this comes up every once in a while where we've got somebody in cardiogenic shock and we start them on a dopamine drip because we have those are easy to get. And uh, we're, we're doing like a five to 10 uh, mic per kilo per minute range. And somebody will say, well, let's go up higher. We aren't giving the response we get. Well, actually, if you go up too high, like if you go up towards 20, you lose some of that beta. You don't get, it's not like you keep everything. You kind of transition over to alpha. And dopamine is actually a more effective inotropic uh, drug in this range than it is in here. So it's sort of uh, a little bit paradoxical. And I think in that sense where you have, you'd expect it to keep that, but it, it doesn't. Um, and that's sort of a unique thing to dopamine. So just so you guys know, it's not, not really special to the other ones. Dopamine is kind of an oddball. Uh, there's pure inotropes again. If low cardiac output after fluid resuscitation, uh, again, if you have a patient on a beta blocker, that's a, a good thing to think about when you're working up somebody in cardiogenic shock because if you give your uh, dobutamine or anything really that works on the beta receptors, the odds of you getting uh, enough support to overwhelm the beta receptors and get those beta blockers off, it's going to be harder for you to get that. So milrinone works around that, and you can get good cardiogenic support without having to worry about the fact that the patient might have taken their beta blocker that, that morning. All right, um, septic shock, talked about this a little bit with ED. It's going to be the same thing concept here. We're starting uh, broad-spectrum IV agents fast, um, getting our cultures done, um, contacting infectious infection source, or uh, contacting um, ID if you need to, uh, controlling your source, identifying your source, de-escalation. So whereas ED is more like, let's just start broad and put the person up on the floor and they'll figure it out as cultures come back and ID gets consult and all that stuff. This is a little different. So here in the critical care area, you're trying to look at de-escalation. So how's the patient responding to what we're giving them? What does the culture data say and what can we get rid of? What can we, maybe we need to change something. Um, and that's a team effort with pharmacy and ID and kind of everyone working together. But that's where you go from there. Um, usually for sepsis, 7 to 10 days of antimicrobial total therapy is appropriate. So if you're looking at a severe sepsis patient who's going to, to recover fully, you're probably at, um, you know, a couple days in the ICU. They'll transition to a med surge floor, and hopefully you can transition them to something oral and get them out to finish their medication that way. Sometimes they stay in for the whole 10 days, depending on how sick they are, if, if not more than that. But... You know, a typical case, if it's well controlled and caught early, um, you can manage it pretty quickly. All right. Uh, one thing about sepsis, a little side note, is glucocorticoid use. Um, it's a little bit controversial, but there is some studies that show that it could be beneficial if you have severe septic shock 
and the blood pressure is not responding to fluids or pressors, and pressors, I should say. Uh, so there, again, there's not a lot of good evidence saying it's actually beneficial in patients to give IV hydrocortisone, but the idea is, is that in critically ill patients, your adrenal system just isn't pumping out anything more. Your body's not making any cortisol, so you don't have any stress hormone or you've used it all up. Uh, and so the question is, is if you give a supplement to that. So remember, hydrocortisone is basically the exact same structure as endogenous steroid hormone that we use, or endogenous cortisol. So if we give hydrocortisone, is it supplementing that system and helping the body's stress response? Um, theoretically, it makes sense, but in, in practice, it doesn't really seem to have ben that many benefits. However, at the same time, you're looking at patient populations that aren't responding to fluids or pressors at high doses. So person's really sick to begin with, and the question is, does it really matter, and would it even cause negative harm, or would cause harm in the patient to get them steroids? And no, it's probably neutral, if, if nothing else. So what it's thought of is like a last-ditch effort. If you have nothing to, to, to lose by giving it, um, if your patient's not responding and they've on, you know, two, three max dose pressors, fluids are going, um, try it. It's worth a shot. It's, again, it's probably not going to hurt the patient at that phase in their, in their current state, but um, it is an option for those patients, but it's not something we routinely. The point in the in my me talking about this is it's not something you just start on any septic or hypotensive patient. You got to go down the pathway first before you give steroids. All right, pain in ICU. Uh, critically ill patients are going to have lots of pain, so um, staying on top of the pain is really important. Usually, um, acute, uh, short-acting IV. Uh, um, what am I trying to say? Opioids are, are what we use in most patients. You can certainly use other things. So we have acetaminophen and, and NSAIDs for synergy, depending on what's appropriate. Um, you have uh, IV options of those. So if oral route's not an option, you can give Tylenol IV. You can give uh, Ketorolac IV if you need to. Uh, but generally, opioids are going to be done. So these patients may be on an opioid drip long term. It might help with sedation, especially if they're ventilated. Um, otherwise, acute boluses here or there, depending on pain scale. Uh, if somebody, like I'm trying to think of patients that might be in our ICU that are more with it. Like if you have a, if you have a patient who just had a stroke and they got a TPA, they're going to get, the, they bought themselves an ICU stay in our neuro ICU overnight. Uh, they might be fine actually, because you can recover pretty quickly if you get TPA and you catch it early enough. So they might be okay, but maybe they're in pain or maybe they have something else going on or maybe they fell and they, you know, hurt their hip or something. Who knows? Um, you could give them, uh, you could assess them normally there. So it depends on the patient. If your patient's totally sedated and out, you have a lot more things to consider. And we'll talk about that here in a second. So this is something how, or uh, one of the pain scales they might use to see if somebody is uh, in pain based on behavior. Uh, based on facial expressions, upper limb movements, and uh, compliance with mechanical ventilation. So if you're mechanically ventilated, you're sedated. That doesn't mean you're not experiencing pain, though. Uh, so making sure that, depending on how they're working with the ventilator, um, that could be a clue as to if they're experiencing some sort of uncomfortable pain. If the person's paralyzed, like if they're, um, if you if you've done hypothera or sorry, um, therapeutic hypothermia, then um, this a lot of this isn't going to matter because they aren't going to be able to move. So it's a little trickier. Uh, but that's why we give them fentanyl as a sedative. So we kind of cover our bases with the pain from that perspective. Again, opioids are probably enough. Uh, sedatives like propofol and dexmedetomidine don't have an analgesic component to them or have a minimal analgesic component to them. So you don't get that. You, you get amnesia and you get sedation, but you don't get the, the pain relief. So the patient's still in pain. They just might not remember it. And the problem with that is it increases delirium, it increases length of ICU stay. So controlling the pain in a sedated patient is actually really important. Um, benzodiazepines, we um, tend to avoid these if we can. However, there are some uses for them. Um, they are associated with prolonged mechanical ventilation, increased ICU length of stay, and delirium. Um, sometimes we do use infusions, but it's going to be a special case. We prefer to stick to our sedation uh, management for propofol and dexmedetomidine and our preferred drugs. And then if you are going to give a benzodiazepine, it's recommended to give it alongside of uh, chronic, a chronic continuous opioid infusion as well. So sometimes we'll do uh, midazolam and fentanyl together, and that gives you uh, some synergy so you don't have to give quite as much of either to get the same sedative effects, and hopefully you can not cause any of this stuff. However, there is always a risk with benzos, so we try to avoid them, unless you have a really good reason. Like really good reasons would be 
um, somebody with irretractable seizures and they're responding well to the uh, continuous benzodiazepine infusion. Um, alcohol withdrawal patients who might be, uh, would be kind of a similar picture. They're probably seizing is why you'd be doing that, but that'd be another person who's at risk for withdrawal. And so you're getting a, a you know, two therapeutic uses out of the drug. That way it's sedating them and uh, it's preventing them from getting a recurring seizure. So there are some uses for them that are appropriate, but um, we do use them cautiously, more so than we used to. All right, let's review sedation stuff really quick. I know we talked about this during uh, spring, but just to uh, touch on these drugs for a second. Uh, propofol, so propofol, we talked about this with respect to conscious sedation. Pretty rapid onset, couple minutes. Duration will be longer the longer the infusion goes. So remember, it, it, it distributes into fatty tissues, and then it kind of has this multi-phase kinetic distribution where in the short term, it really doesn't get outside the bloodstream. It kind of goes into the central nervous system. And that's about it. The longer you give it, the more it kind of leaches into other tissues, and then it can leach back out. So if you've been on propofol for a couple days, turning it off is not just going to be like a switch, whereas if you're on propofol for a few hours during a surgery and you stop it, the person's probably going to wake back up pretty quickly. Uh, so again, it depends on how long they've had it. Uh, hypotension is one of the biggest hemodynamic effects with propofol, so we watch out for that. Um, no analgesic activity, uh, has caloric content, so if you're looking at total nutrition intake with the patient, that's an, actually an important thing we, we take into consideration, depending on how much they're getting. There is something really rare called propofol infusion syndrome, and I've never actually seen this happen, but it's fatal if it does, or it can be, and uh, it's used for high doses, high extended periods of time. What I think about is if you started somebody on a really high propofol infusion without uh, ramping them up at first. That's where I've seen in the literature this being an issue, but again, it's quite rare. Uh, but it does cause some sort of mitochondrial meta metabolism interference, which can cause met metabolic acidosis and ultimately lead to kind of a cardiac arrest-like picture. So, rare, not a reason we don't use propofol. In fact, none of these are really reasons we don't use propofol. Even if it's hypotensive, we still sedate people with propofol, even if they're septic and hypotensive, because we can hopefully get them back with pressors. Um, so it's like the lesser of two evils. Propofol doesn't cause this incredibly profound hypotension. It causes some transient, relatively mild hypotension. Now, in certain patients, that might be enough to put them over the edge where you'd want to maybe try a different item. So, like, let's say you have a septic patient, and they're on high-dose pressors, they're on fluid boluses, their maps are kind of hanging in there, but they kind of keep creeping down, and they're on propofol. That might be a good patient to stop propofol on and try either Presidex or dexmedetomidine, which doesn't lower the blood pressure quite as much, or even better, fentanyl and Versed as a combo. I know I said we don't like using benzos, but fentanyl and Versed don't cause much hemodynamic instability. They won't drop blood pressure very much at all. So that's one of the preferred options we have if somebody's really hypotensive and not coming up. And then you have ketamine as well. I didn't put ketamine on any of these slides, but that's a, a sedative that could be used to actually increase the blood pressure. You can use that as a continuous infusion uh, also. So you have some alternates if you need to uh, try something different than propofol. Uh, Presidex, talked about this. Um, again, you might get some hypotension. It's not quite as bad as propofol. It does cause a little bit more bradycardia than um, any of the other sedatives, so that might be something to watch. Um, analgesic effect is not known. It's not thought to have a significant significant components generally recommended to give some sort of synergistic analgesic medication. Uh, most of the studies uh, are a little bit um, nebulous as far as what's better, propofol or dexmedetomidine, and patients do seem to require less analgesic medication based on uh, current evidence on uh, dexmedetomidine versus propofol. And um, ICU length of stay and delirium are both decent with propofol and dexmedetomidine if you compare them to benzos plus fentanyl. So if you're looking at the two against our, our old standard, which is fentanyl and Versa drips for sedation, um, both of them are, are improvements, but which one is better when it comes to that, we don't really know yet. It is kind of expensive. It's a little more expensive than propofol, but it's not a reason not to prescribe it. It's fine. As far as cost goes, it's not terrible. All right. Um, RAS is something we often titrate our sedations to, so that's the Richmond Agitation and Sedation Scale. So when you, if you order a sedative on an ICU patient, it'll say, um, what do you want to put your RAS score at? And so it'll usually be like a range, so um, like 1 to 2 or 3 to 4 are kind of the common ones. Or sorry, negative 1 to 2, negative 3 to 4. You don't want somebody agitated, right? Uh, so this is how significantly sedated they are. I don't know, I mean, these would be like if somebody is on a little bit of sedative and they're really aggressively working against their ventilation or something. 
Um, drowsy light sedation. This is sort of more like a conscious sedation picture right here. Um, usually you aren't going to have this for somebody who's got uh, a breathing tube going. Um, three and four is usually what I see the uh, the common like titrations for if somebody's mechanically ventilated. So it's pretty common is what they're targeting there. So if you ever, ever see RAS three to four, that's what they're referring to. I don't care, you know that for my exam, but that's just what it's usually prescribed and titrated to. So then nurses will use criteria to manage that and increase and decrease the dose. So you'll put in a range of infusion when you enter propofol, like 1 to 60 mic per kilo per minute, and the nurse will titrate that based on the RAS score, how they're assessing the patient. And this is just an example of a flow sheet of how you might assess RAS. So again, I don't care you know this, it's just an example of what they do. Um, delirium in the ICU, I just put this on there because it was it's sort of an old, um, old study, but it looked at nursing assessments of delirium and how they were looking at it. Um, so basically, no one was ever consulting psychiatry, which now we do that a lot more. Um, people were using a couple different tools, like um, the different uh, agitation, sedation-related tools, and agitation-related events, too, were, were documented. So the, the point is, we didn't really have a great way to to score this stuff, and not everyone was using the same tool. Some nurses hadn't even heard of, you know, the, the CAM ICU or the CWA, which are really commonly used now. So the point in me showing you some of this is for delirium management, we have flow she sheets like this, and if somebody's, you know, coming up at a RAS score where they're agitated or very agitated, and even though you've got sedation going, that might be a sign that they've got some delirium going on. So. Delirium is really common in the ICU, unfortunately. The longer you're in an ICU, the longer you're sedated, the more likely you are to get delirious. Uh, it's also sort of associated with increased mortality. It also costs healthcare a lot of money. So it's a big metric around ICU care is decreasing length of stay. The earlier you can get somebody safely out of an ICU, the lower hospital costs you incur. Um, so how do we manage that if it does happen, and it does happen occasionally? Um, haloperidol and second-generation antipsychotics are usually the, the drugs of choice. So um, specifically, olanzapine, um, risperidone, Seroquel, those ones are the most commonly studied. Um, so some of kind of the standard older second generations I think of is all being acceptable. Haloperidol is fine. However, its studies don't show it as great at actually reducing delirium itself. It seems to manage the symptoms more. Uh, than anything else. So second generations like Zyprexa have become more and more the standard of care when it comes to delirium management. A lot of these things aren't very well studied though, you know, very small groups of patients. Um, there's not a lot of uh, clinical, FD, well, I should say on the drug company, and there's not a lot of clinical trials and FDA approvals going on for this type of stuff. But it's such small groups of patients, so they don't really care. It's sort of on healthcare providers to figure it out. So anyway, um, second generation antipsychotics are generally preferred. Limiting certain classes of drugs is always important to do, too. So looking at your benzos, anticholinergics, and opioids, I think those are the big three. We talked about this already with geriatrics. Same thing here, same story. Those are the three obvious targets you want to look at when you're trying to eliminate sources of delirium if you think it's medication-related. Um, therapeutic paralysis. So um, hypothermia, we use uh, continuous infusions of a paralytic agent. So usually we're using one of the um, atracurium or cisatracurium are the preferred drugs. Cisatracurium is almost always preferred. It's a little bit uh, easier to titrate and adjust than any of the other ones. That's one we use. Unless it's on shortage, we always use cisatracurium. So your, your therapeutic paralysis is going to go hand in hand with sedation. So for a coolant patient, that's what we call our therapeutic hypothermia patients, we do uh, fentanyl versa drip and cisatracurium drip, and that's it. So again, the fentanyl is providing some pain relief that we can't assess because the person's um, paralyzed, and uh, they're, they're, the two work together to give you that synergistic effect. Now, is there a delirium risk with versed? Yeah, but we that's what we do, because that's how it was studied originally. Um, let's see. I think that's all I needed to say. All right, therapeutic hypothermia, 32 to 36 degrees Celsius, 24 hours, then you gradually rewarm at 0.25 degrees Celsius per hour. Why? You realize, uh, reduce risk of neurologic injury. A lot of cool, I don't know if you guys talked about this in other classes, I just think it's cool how they cool, cool how they cool people. It sounds really dumb. Uh, but you can do lots of ways. I mean, I think the old school way, you just shoved ice packs in kind of people's groin and, and axillary regions. And now they have all these neat, like, like you have an indwelling um, catheter that pumps cool water and it actually has a temperature sensor on it too that can um, 
uh, tell you, and then it automatically adjusts how cold the water is to keep the temperature going. So you have all this neat technology that really does this manually, or automatically, I should say, and takes the manual process out of it. So again, it's kind of cool. Um, we have been uh, at Abbott, it's kind of a special thing for us because we pioneered a lot of it at our hospital. And we're part of a lot of the early studies and outcomes associated with it. It is standard of care throughout the country now, so that's pretty neat. And it is shown to have good benefits for people if you cool them uh, after a, a resuscitated arrest. Now, assuming they aren't talking to you, right? If they came back from their arrest and they're seeming fine neurologically, obviously you're going to sedate them and cool, and that makes no sense. But somebody who's returned from an arrest, they have a, a good perfusing arrhythmia, or an arrhythmia, a good perfusing rhythm, uh, but they aren't conscious, that would be a cool it patient. And you guys probably talked about that at ACLS, so you all know more than it about me because I haven't done it in a while. So anyway, uh, that's it for sort of the acute phase stuff. I just want to talk about a couple little things as far as what else we manage in ICU patients, what else we consider important. Um, so hyperhypoglycemia in critical care patients, uh, for a long time they thought that targeting a really aggressive blood sugar goal was ideal, so they targeted 80 to 110. There was a study in 2001 that showed that um, there were uh, mortality benefits associated with tighter blood glucose goals. In fact, um, the problem was is that uh, people kept getting hypoglycemic when you tried to target goals that tightly. So you'd overdo the insulin, you'd have to correct, it was a mess. It's just really hard to get somebody 80 to 110. So in 2009, the study called Nice Sugar came out. It was uh, targeted blood glucose just less than 180, uh, but not hypoglycemic. And it showed to have basically the same outcomes, no uh, changes in mortality, and uh, you had um, much, much less risk of hypoglycemia. So that's what we do now. We don't target these aggressive goals anymore. I just put that in there for historic purposes. But a lot of patients are hyperglycemic, so for whatever reason. So we do use insulin protocols on patients a lot. And from a provider perspective, it's pretty easy to do this. You just order the insulin protocol, and it's all nursing run, at least at our hospital and within Alina and a lot of hospitals. It's pretty standard to have a nursing run insulin infusion. So they'll check blood sugars. They'll run it through a protocol, computer-type program that tells them what to change it at. Pharmacies involved kind of peripherally, but I don't even, we don't even really do a whole lot with them. It's mostly nursing driven. Um, and those protocols are actually really good. They're, um, our hypoglycemic episodes since we initiated this new program a few years ago have basically gone to almost zero. They're really rare now because we have so many, the, pro, the program is really good at, I guess, offering recommendations and making sure the patient's not getting to that point. But if it does, there's stepwise recommendations to keep the blood sugar up, prevent it from getting hypoglycemic. Stress ulcer prophylaxis, uh, so ulcers are a big problem for ICU patients, especially for mechanically ventilated patients and um, anybody with a coagulopathy, which is going to be a lot of patients in the ICU. A lot of them are going to be on heparin. A lot of them are going to be therapeutically anticoagulated with other drugs like warfarin. Some might have uh, thrombocytopenia, though that would be a little bit more rare. Um, other risk factors, two or more, there's a number of things here. A lot of it comes down to just being sedentary, too. You aren't moving around. And um, the stress ulcers can happen just because of the, the way the patient's positioned chronically. So prophylaxis is important. We give uh, IV H2 blockers are a common drug. They're cheap. They're effective. You can give PPIs, too. Uh, there's not really any evidence to support them in critical care populations, but they probably work just fine. They're just more expensive, especially IV PPIs are a lot more expensive than IV H2s. So that's what we give. Um, we don't use any type of short-acting things like Tums or sulfurphane. And then one thing I would say is if you do end up working critical care or hospital in general, if you prescribe somebody something like this during a hospital stay and your goal is just to have it during that hospital stay, please discontinue it or instruct the patient not to keep taking it. You wouldn't believe how many patients get started on these drugs and take them for years and then come back into the hospital and like, why are you taking a PPI? Oh, I started on it. I was in the hospital. And you go back and look, sure enough, as a prophylactic measure that never got discontinued. It happens all the time. And now your patient's back in the hospital to see that. So unfortunately for you. <laughs> um, PEDVT, -E so venous thromboembolism risk is very high just mostly because of immobilization. Uh, depends on the surgery site too. Uh, mechanical prophylaxis is usually what they try first. So these things are like giant compression stockings that actually have pneumatic systems that move blood. So they actually kind of pulse. And um, pharmacologic options can be used in certain situations, but um, we try the mechanical stuff too. Uh, first, if it's indicated or if they're lower risk, if they're higher risk, we'll go to a pharmaceutical option. Um, subcutaneous heparin is a really common uh, VTE prophylactic item. So 
low dose, 5,000 units, either twice a day or three times a day, kind of depending on your age or weight is how we cut it off. Low molecular weight heparin, so anoxaparin, at once a day dosing, 40 milligrams every 24 hours is another really common choice as well. Um, you can give IV heparin. It uh, just is going to be more expensive and more time consuming and, and management consuming than giving something sub -Q. And again, patients might be on anticoagulation for other reasons. And of course, if they're therapeutically anticoagulated, you aren't going to give them anything additionally to prophylax them. So they're already covered. Uh, ventilator associated pneumonia, pneumonia and nosocomial infections. Um, Basically, try and minimize the, the contact of the patient. Make sure good hand hygiene is in place. Those are kind of the no-brainers. Uh, these are some of the risk factors for it. The longer the person is in, in a hospital or an ICU and ventilated, the higher the risk they have at getting this. <clears throat> we're going to limit antibiotics overall and PPIs to avoid C. diff risk. But if somebody does get this, we're going to treat it with um, broad-spectrum antibiotics. So um, I didn't really put that on here, but you would treat it just like a a pseudomonas type pneumonia, so vancomycin, for cover your MRSA, zosin. And sometimes we double cover with VAP too, so we might do like a, a zosin or cefepime plus maybe a fluoroquinolone like levofloxacin to get two pseudomonal agents on board. And nutrition. This isn't my area of expertise, but uh, most, pharma most hospitals' pharmacy departments manage the TPNs, or total parenteral nutrition. Enteral nutrition, I have absolutely nothing to do with, so I'm not going to talk about it, other than that if you can use the GI tract, you should use the GI tract. It's a preferred way to get nutrition. Um, enteral nutrition, or, or parenteral nutrition, I should say, is uh, usually started if you're intolerant of enteral nutrition for about seven days or so. However, there are some studies that say to start earlier, and the, the evidence is a little bit mixed. <clears throat> Formulas are super complicated, but they can comprise dextrose, amino acids, electrolytes, vitamins, trace elements, and then lipids. Um, a TPN usually looks like this. It's kind of a bag that looks yellow. That's because um, IV multivitamins are kind of a yellow color, and that's what gives them the tint there. Uh, and then this is the lipid hanging separately, this white emulsion. You don't mix lipids with TPN because lipids aren't really compatible. They'll, they'll make weird chunks and precipitate, stuff like that. So we give them separately. Um, I don't want you to know how to calculate TPNs at all. I don't care you know how to do this. I'm just going to walk through it very quickly, and I'm not an expert at this, but I want to tell you how generally we get there, just in case you end up ordering it at some point in your career, and you're like, I don't even know anything about this, and this is how we do it. So um, there's a lot of uh, equations that vary out there about how you calculate daily caloric needs, but basically you're looking at body mass index, and then you're looking at some other factors, so whether they're mechanically ventilated, on dialysis, pregnant. If they're para- or quadriplegic, that might have some effects on the calculations as well. There's some stress factors that might increase the caloric in intake, so acute kidney injury, cancer, sepsis might uh, add a little bit more to it. A normal equation for figuring this out is 10 times your weight and plus uh, 6.25 times your height minus age, and then you times it by your stress factor, and that should give you kind of a daily caloric need. So if you want to calculate it on yourself, go for it. Uh, but that's basically what you would use. It's a standard nutrition equation. That's what we use in the hospital. Um, your protein goal, so part of your total calories is going to be protein, obviously. We usually target 1 to 2 grams per day, per kilo per day. And then, um, so we'll figure what that is. So if somebody's like, let's say, 70 kilos, that's 70 grams of protein a day. So then we figure out how many calories that is and subtract that from the total calorie count. So essentially, you want to give all the calories, and then you want to separate it out based on the different components. So that's your protein. Lipids are made from soybean oil and egg yolk. Uh, so the lipids are supposed to have about 25 to 30% of your total calories, and then dextrose is going to make up the remainder. So again, protein, um, the one to two grams per kilo per day. Uh, lipids is a percentage based of total calories, and then dextrose is the remainder of that. So you kind of ballpark it. It doesn't have to be exact. That's basically how we calculate it. Everything else after that is all sort of, I don't know. I, I get a little cynical about some of this because with the electrolytes, you can really micromanage these in TPNs, and I don't think it has a huge impact. A lot of patients, patients who are on TPNs are likely going to be on electrolyte replacement protocols too, so they're going to be getting labs checked pretty regularly and potassium magnesium replaced as needed much more aggressively than they're going to get out of the TPN. We certainly include things like standard electrolytes, so sodium, potassium, mag, phosphorus, stuff like that in the TPN, but um, whether or not that's enough for them, it'll just depend on the patient. So. 
Um, trace elements, we have like a standard trace element multivitamin into TPN that's a, a, a fixed amount that goes into everyone. We don't really think about that one too heavily. Um, depending on what hospital or system you work for, nutrition services may manage the calorie components. So for example, at ours, pharmacy does all the TPN, but dietary will weigh in and recommend calorie changes or like calorie restriction or calorie additions if they think like the patient needs more protein or whatever. So we usually just defer to them. But we do the basics on how to calculate it all and put it together. There are also pre-made versions on the market that are just a set like 5% protein, 15% dextrose, and then you'd give that and then put the rest of your lipids in with it and you call it good. It has a standard set of electrolytes in it as well. Um, we use those on some patients too. So it just depends. Every place does it a little bit differently, but the point is, is that TPN, I just want you to know what the components are. I know that there's a lot of monitoring involved with it. So people have uh, metabolic panels, FOS and MEG, triglycerides, CBCs, LFTs, uh, sometimes ABGs, just to get all that. Make uh, TPN can be kind of stressful on the body, especially the liver and the kidneys over time. And then there's something called refeeding syndrome too, which can happen if your patient's been somewhat malnourished or in a almost starvation state because they haven't had any enteral nutrition for a few days. And you give them something, it can cause a big um, shift in some electrolytes usually this isn't a big deal but sometimes you can get really odd fluctuations in phosphorus which if they change drastically can have some effects sometimes on the cardiac system so anyway just something to think about and, and consider but not not again something i'm going to test you on on crrt continuous renal replacement therapy so obviously you could be on dialysis if you needed to uh, needed that during your icu stay um, a step above that is CRRT. So where we do continuous renal replacements, basically like continuous dialysis going all the time. Um, like where I see this done is in severe like strep pneumo pneumonias that where there's a lot, where they have a bacteria that's producing a lot of toxins. You can remove those by CRRT. There's no real other way to treat the person. Um, I've seen this done for really heavy overdoses in some patients too. Uh, they do it. They do it a lot for other things as well. But the point is, is that it's an option. If you really need something to get rid of um, some, something in the bloodstream that's continuously being manufactured or like if it's enterohepatically recycling or however it's getting into the system, um, that's an option for some people. So, all right. Any questions on critical? I won't ask you any CRT questions. I'm barely qualified to even talk about it.